Well, um, as we begin here, I just want to ask you a question. Have you ever received an invitation uh, to an event uh, that asks you to RSVP for this event? RSVP, um, they're initials of a French phrase. I'm not going to pronounce, I'm not going to butcher French, but it, it just means respond if you please. That's what RSVP stands Respond if you please. And so you get this invitation, you open up, take out your phone, or for those of you who still have your regular paper calendars, you open up your calendar and you look at that date um, and, and you notice that there is a schedule conflict. You have something else for that time, for that date. And, and so something else is more important. Perhaps uh, you have work scheduled or maybe some kind of family engagement, family obligation. It has higher priority for you than this party or whatever this event is. And so you mark no and send that reply back. But maybe you got another invitation to a party and you know that person and that person, man, you love that person. Um, in fact, you know when that person throws parties, he's a great host. He has the best of food. He has the best of entertainment. When you come and when you enjoy, you actually leave with a gift because this host gives you party favors. And so you look at your calendar and then you figure out that you also have a couple things on it. But, man, this invitation... This event far outweighs whatever it is that's on your calendar because this is special invitation. And no doubt you will do everything to move it around. You may even call your boss to ask him if you can switch with someone because you want to be at this party. You'd be a fool to turn down this invitation. I don't know if you've ever experienced this. I'm sure you have. And I'm sure you've moved things around because of how precious and how special this person is that invites you in. Open your Bibles to Matthew 22. We come now to this third and final parable in which Jesus continues to indict the religious leaders of their faithlessness. He already told them two parables um, in chapter 21, which pictured the fact that the kingdom of God is being taken away from them and it is given to a people, as Jesus said at the end of chapter 21, who will give fruit, who, who will produce fruit for God, the kind of fruit that God seeks. And now Jesus finishes up here with this final parable. And this parable is about a wedding. It's about a reception. And you know, as, as most weddings, most weddings, they end... Um, joyfully, they end with when the groom and the bride, they, they gather together and, and they leave and they enter wedding chambers with great joy and, and, and the party ends. Well, this wedding here ends with a man entering into outer darkness with weeping and gnashing of teeth. It's a very different setting. Something profound happens here in this parable. The groom and the father who threw this party for his son, they are terribly dishonored. I want us to read this before we look at it verse by verse and see what we learn about our father, to see what we learn about the son, Jesus Christ, and to see how we could properly respond to both. Verse 22, or chapter 22, verse 1, Jesus spoke to them again in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding feast for his son. And when he sent out his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding feast, and they were unwilling to come. Again, he sent out other slaves, saying, Tell those who have been invited, behold, I have prepared my dinner. My oxen and my fattened livestock are all butchered and everything is ready. Come to the wedding feast. But they paid no attention and went their way, one to his own farm, another to his business. And the rest seized his slaves and mistreated them and killed them. But the king was 
enraged. And he sent his armies and destroyed those murderers and set their city on fire. Then he said to his slaves, the wedding is ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. Go therefore to the main highways, and as many as you find there, invite to the wedding feast. Those slaves went out into the streets and gathered together all they found, both evil and good, and the wedding hall was filled with dinner guests. But when the king came in to look over the dinner guests, he saw a man there who was not dressed in wedding clothes. And he said to him, friend, how did you come in here without wedding clothes? And the man was speechless. Then the king said to the servants, bind him hand and foot and throw him into the outer darkness. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. What an end to a wedding feast. What an end to this parable. As we consider what's in front of us here, I want us to just uh, gather our thoughts around this one main big idea. And that is this call. Embrace God's gracious invitation to his banquet with humility and faith because he is truly worth it. To embrace God's gracious invitation to his generous banquet. But we must embrace it with humility and faith. Because God and his son are truly worthy of our embrace. I want us to look at four things. First, we're going to look at the great invitation. The great invitation. Second, the gross insult. Then we're going to look at the grave insult indignation and finally in the last part of the parable we're going to look at the gracious inclination we're going to take it one by one as the lord continues to teach number one the great invitation and here's the great invitation the invitation goes out come to the feast come to the feast jesus here begins look with me at the text with the king and it's all about the king This parable, even though it has other characters, it's all about this king. In fact, the king is the only one who's recorded as speaking here in this parable. There's a lot going on, but as far as who the main person is, it is this king. He's the primary player in the parable. And this king is, we are told, prepares a uh, wedding feast for his son. Now, in this particular culture here... Um, even a wedding for, you know, an ordinary family, you don't have to be someone from, you know, high order or, or um, some kind of royal family. Uh, a normal wedding would basically run seven days, It'd run a week, just lots of festivities, lots of celebration. But this wedding here is not ordinary. This family is not ordinary. This is a royal family, and the king has his son to celebrate. And given the magnitude of this event, then the king sends out his slaves, and he invites those who had been called. Now, the custom of the day was to invite to the wedding feast a long time before everything is prepped. It's sort of like we do today. Save the date, right? Whenever there's a a wedding date that's been uh, set, the couple would just maybe email you something or send you a little postcard, save the date. And and then when you RSVP, then they will send you the official invitation. And so it works exactly the same way here. Now, what does all of this mean as far as our application, as far as the context? The wedding feast here, what does it represent? Well, the wedding feast, um, for anybody who heard during that time, it represented a time of fellowship, really a a joyful event that was promised specifically to the nation of, of Israel, and it was directly tied to the appearance of Messiah. Directly tied to the appearance of Messiah. It was a time of celebration. It was a time of unspeakable joy because it was a time of salvation. Wedding feast is salvation, salvation for this nation. Look with me at Isaiah 25, for instance, verse 6 and following. The Lord of hosts, Isaiah 
prophesies, will prepare a lavish banquet for all peoples on this mountain, a banquet of aged wine, choice pieces with marrow, and refined aged wine. And it will be said in that day, behold, this is our God for whom we have waited, that he might save us. This is the Lord for whom we have waited. Let us rejoice and be glad in his salvation. So the wedding feast portrays this amazing day, this amazing period of time when Messiah will come and he will gather his people and his people will look to him and say, this is our God. Behold, our salvation is here. Now, historically, when you look at Scripture and, and uh, the, the progress of Revelation and redemptive history specifically, God first calls Abraham, in, remember in Genesis chapter 12, and he promises to bless him and through him to bless all the nations of the world. And as Abraham multiplied and, and as this family began to multiply, it became a, a great nation and this nation moved into Egypt and it was rescued out of Egypt, went into promised land and, and this nation became idolatrous and was booted out of the promised land. But nevertheless, God continued through the prophets to prophesy and to give them promises that one day through this nation, a Messiah will come who will redeem them from their sins. And as they waited for the Messiah, according to Galatians 4, the time came, when the fullness of time came, God sent his son to be among the people, to walk among them, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord, as we have looked already in Matthew, to proclaim to them the day of salvation. He came to bring salvation because that's what the angel said. He will, what, save his people from their sin. And so the king here in this parable clearly refers to God, God the Father and the Son. Well, we know who the Son is. The Son is Jesus Christ. The Son has already been identified as Christ in the previous parable. But I want you to see something about the relationship of this Father and the Son. The Father loves the Son. And he wants to throw him a party. And he wants to invite others to enjoy, to rejoice with the Son. And time has come. Jesus is here. It's time to rejoice, to be glad for salvation is near. That's what this wedding feast pictures here. And before we move on, I, I just want you to consider the significance or, or the nature of this invitation. This is a great invitation. It's an invitation to a wedding. Friends, it is not an invitation to a funeral. What do weddings picture? When you go to the wedding, when you get an invitation, you're filled with joy. Wow, I have the, the honor to go and to see the bride and groom, right? To honor them, to rejoice, to sing, right? Dancing, music, happiness. That's what weddings are all about. When, when Abraham as I already referred to, when he was serving other gods in, in a foreign land, when God called him out, he, he told him that, come follow me and I will bless you. This word blessing is, I will, I will make you happy. You will rejoice and through you all the nations will rejoice. They will be giving this happiness. This is what God was inviting Israel to and what he ultimately prepared for us through the gospel, through the gospel invitation. He invites us to enjoy life with the Father and with the Son. This one Father and the Son, they're bound in love and they're saying, we're going to invite guests so that they can participate in this joyful event, in this salvation. We're going to invite them in. And this is the nature of this great invitation. This is what it's all about because of the one who invites you in. He is great and he invites you to discover life, to discover life in his name. That's what, what the wedding feast is about. I want you to, to remind you, John uh, 10. In John 10, Jesus, when during his earthly ministry, he says, you know why I came? I came so that you may have life. That was the purpose of his coming, life. And what kind of life? Abundant life. An invitation to have life. And yet, as the parable goes on, we read at the end of verse 3, and they were unwilling, they were unwilling to come. And so we come to this gross insult. 
gross insult. Church, we are so far removed from the historical context of this day that it's hard for us to understand this parable properly. In fact, I think, um, I don't know if you can go back to the time when you first read Matthew 22. For many of you, it's been years. Years, right? Because you, you know the context. You've been reading the New Testament probably more than the Old Testament. And so this parable is so real. It's so familiar to us. But if you can go back to that time, uh, I'm not a betting man, but I was willing, I'm willing to bet that when you first read this parable, you were offended that the king was offended. In other words, uh, when we read this parable, we get offended at the wrong thing than what the Lord wants us to be offended at. When we read that the king had this fellow at the very end, right, um, thrown out into the darkness, then we, we kind of like, hey, king, calm down. What is, I mean, what's wrong with you? You're the one who invited him, and where did you invite him off? You invited him off the street, off the back alleys. What did you expect him to wear? Right? Maybe, maybe you're overreacting here. And so we need to properly understand the cultural context in order to understand what is going on because Jesus here uses true-to-life examples to, to make his point. At that time, to reject this great invitation would be an insult to a king. It wasn't like the invitation that we received today to a wedding. When you look at your calendar and you say, sorry, I got something else, I, I, I can't make it. No, this would have been considered an act of rebellion against the king. When a royal dignitary invited you to come, his invitation superseded every other engagement and obligation that you already had on your calendar. In fact, it was a royal obligation. It was a summons. It was a warrant. We, we have that nowadays, right? You're afraid at times to get this letter in your mail, jury duty. Oh, gotta go. You gotta go. Why? You have been summoned to serve. And when you get selected to be on the jury, guess what? Your boss is required to let you go. Why? Because that summons supersedes his authority. And that's exactly what is going on here. This order to Israel came from God, the sovereign one. And yet they refused because they did not consider him or his son worthy. They were unwilling to come. But just like in the previous parables that we looked at, God is full of patience. He's full of mercy and grace, and he sends out other slaves. And this time, this is amazing to me, this time he gives them the menu. It's like, here's the menu, go show them what I have prepared for them. And, and it's almost like he's pleading with them, hey, let me, let me show you what I have prepared. Like I have prime ribs, I have filet mignon. I have all the good stuff that, that you would ever want. It's here. It's for you. Everything is ready. You don't have to bring anything. You know, like we get some invitation, bring your own whatever. Bring your own chips or bring soda or bring. This is not potluck, friends. No. This is not what we do for Thanksgiving dinner here where we have one group bring this and another group bring that. No, everything is supplied. Everything is provided by God. Why? Because he is gracious and he doesn't need our contribution. All he asks is that you would come, respond. The king takes care of everything. But, verse 5, they paid no attention. They did not care. They were so busy. What were they busy with? Well, we're told here in verse 5 that they went on their own way, one to his own farm, another to his business. You know what this says is they were just too busy living. They were taking care of their kids. They were taking care of their spouses. They were just going to work. They had to wake up in the morning. They were taking care of their businesses. They needed to make money in order to supply for themselves, in order to live. 
Nothing is out of ordinary here. They were simply going about their life. They were passive. Common things, regular things in life that are good, that are necessary. Like my, what, what they were saying is my family, my farm, my business today is more important than the king's summons. I don't care. I have this. And if I could just take care of this, my own little kingdom, then, then that's fine. Paid no attention. And verse 6 and the rest, there was another group. They, they weren't just busy living. They resorted to killing Verse 6, and the rest seized his slaves and mistreated them and killed them. Some were passively going on with life. Others took matters into their own hands. And, and this, is, this right here is unreasonable. This is puzzling. This is crazy, their reaction. It's not even like in the previous parable where these uh, slaves, they come in and they require you to give them money or produce because the, the vineyard owner send them to you. It's like, hey, where's my stuff? The king is asking for his stuff. And so they're like, we're not giving you stuff. We're going to kill you. Here, they're not asking for anything. They're only coming with good news. They're only inviting them to where? To a joyful occasion. Hey, come and hang out with the king and his son because he is worthy. But instead of honoring the king, and his son with their presence, they dishonor him. Friends, this is the crime of this passage. The one who is most worthy is deemed utterly unworthy. And so what is the application then? Obviously, this goes hand in hand with all the other parables that we've looked at. Jesus, here is the son. He is the bridegroom. He already referred to himself as the bridegroom in Matthew 9.15. He came to announce the dawn of the kingdom. The, the feast is coming. It's, it's imminent. But the people who have RSVP'd, so to speak, they no longer care. They're, they're not interested in this king, right? Uh, and so if we look at the Old Testament, the, the nation had been given numerous promises about the coming king, about the coming Messiah through the prophets. And, and yet... The announcement was sent, but when the king showed up, nobody, nobody cares. And then when Jesus grew up and, and he started ministering visibly among them, God sent another slave, another prophet. Who was it? We already talked about him, John the Baptist. And he said, hey, here's the king. He's coming. Prepare the way. Prepare the way. He is here. Authoritative call. And yet they refused. And consider this, as we look forward into the end of Matthew and Acts, even after Christ was put to death, after he resurrected, he still extends his mercy to the nation. God is so merciful. He told his disciples when he gave him the great commission, go, right? But before he told them to go, he says, start right here. Start first in Jerusalem and then Judea and then Samaria and then to the other parts of the earth. Paul says that the gospel is first to the Jew. And so that's where they started. They started in their synagogues. They started in their religious centers. And yet, what do the leaders do? Well, the Acts tells us that they sought to silence the preachers of the gospel and even put them to death. And so we read in Acts that they put Stephen to death and they put others to death. These leaders, they proved to be that first son in the first parable who said, yeah, I'm going to go serve God. And yet, when it was time to recognize God, he did not. They were just too busy. They were too busy setting up their own businesses, running their own families, running their own show, too busy to worship God. They were thinking they were worshiping God, but they completely missed God. God's invitation to honor him and his son was met with indifference. It was met with opposition. It was met with hatred. What a terrible response, friends, to continually shun and dishonor the one who gives you the greatest invitation. Come. I'm not inviting you to bring anything with you. Just come and enjoy life. And these guests denied it. 
not because they could not come, but because they would not come. They refused. Beloved, the overarching emphasis here is that God's own people, they fail to see his worth. Fail to see his worth. He is most glorious. He is most worthy. He is most gracious to invite us in to come to dine with him. But he is deemed unworthy. What a horrible thing to harden one's heart against the face of such kindness. Gross insult. And so after multiple attempts, the king's patience, it runs out. You know, Proverbs, I was reminded of this verse, Proverbs 20, verse 2 says, The terror of a king is like a growling of a lion. He who provokes him to anger forfeits his own life. This is an example right here of what is taking place in verse 17. I want you to now see third, the grave indignation. The punishment fits the crime. When the king hears that his invitation is again and again rejected, he simply does this. He orders armies to destroy those murderers and set their city on fire. No further invitation, only extermination here in this case. And beloved, this again is a great lesson about our God. Not that he is always indignant, right, waiting to zap you out of your existence because you don't respond no, the very opposite, actually. Over and over, we, we've seen through our study of Matthew how he invites, how, how Matthew presents who the Father is. He's full of mercy. He's full of compassion. And then the Son who mimics the Father, who's just like the Father, humble and lowly. And he says, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Come and recline at my table. You don't have to bring anything. Just come to me, full of grace and glory. And yet the son here, as we've seen, he's continually scorned. And to disrespect disrespect the son is to disrespect the father. That's why the father takes offense at this. He is greatly insulted. John 5, 23 says, he who does not honor the son does not honor the father who sent him. And this is what it means to be not worthy. Look at verse 8. And then he said to his slaves, the wedding is not ready, but those who were invited were not worthy. What does it mean not to be worthy? It is to dishonor and to shame the king and his son by refusing to respond to this invitation. That is what constitutes unworthiness. And so the punishment now fits the crime. The king is too glorious, too worthy to be treated with such indifference. And there comes a time when his patience runs out and when you literally forfeit your life. And sadly, verse 7 here is a day, is a day that comes less than 40 years after this was pronounced. No doubt this speaks of 70 AD when, when the armies come into Jerusalem, they destroy the city and they destroy the temple. And Jesus will, just in few short days, he will lament over Jerusalem. For instance, and go with me to Matthew 23, verse 37. Look with me at this verse. This is towards the end of the Passion Week. He says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, who kills the prophets and stones those who are sent to her. How often I wanted to gather your children together the way a hen gathers her chicks under her wings, but you were unwilling Behold, your house is being left to you desolate. And then in 24 verse 2, he says, Do you see all these things? Do you see all these beautiful temple buildings? Truly I say to you, not one stone here will be left upon another, which will not be torn down. Which will not be torn down. So this is a a prophetic statement here in 22 in the form of a parable, and yet the judgment on Jerusalem also stands as this stark reminder of the final judgment that will come upon all the unbelieving world. Man, it won't be good. Those who have heard the invitation to salvation in Christ and yet have declined it, it will not go well for them. The warning here is very clear, friends. When the invitation comes to you, 
and the messenger of God calls you to honor the king, do not decline the invitation. Come. Embrace it. He is truly worthy. He is truly worthy. Embrace God's gracious invitation to his banquet. Well, we might expect that this parable should end right now. It, It would be a fitting end to this parable. But to our surprise, the king continues with the wedding feast. It's not canceled. And so the scene here in our parable, it switches from these decliners who decline the invitation to the recliners. There were actually guests. There will be guests at the party. And so we come to this final scene, the gracious inclination. The king's son will be honored. Church, even though the the king's numerous invitations are spurned here, the second half of the uh, parable, it reveals that God's plan to have guests who will honor him and his son will not be set aside. It's not like God says, well, I tried. I tried. No one wants to come. No one wants to hear. I guess it's just you and I. I guess it's just us. No. No. The king will see to it that his son is honored and he is embraced by many guests. By many guests. And praise God for this twist here. Even though those who were previously invited, they were shown themselves as unworthy, this gracious invitation goes out to all. In verse 8, the wedding is ready, but those prove themselves unworthy. So therefore, go into the main highways, and as many as you will find there, invite to the wedding feast. Those slaves went out into the streets and gathered together all they found, both evil and good, and the wedding hall was filled with guests. All. Go find anybody. Go. This is God's plan and it will not be set aside. God is so gracious. He invites all to come, not just his people. The, the highway here, this reference in verse 9, um, the main highways, they are the main roads that lead into the cities. So go to the main highways, and then these alleyways or these streets, you know, they're they're, they're dirty streets where you have a bunch of bums running around. People who are unworthy to come to the banquet to rejoice with the king, go there and find anybody. There's no distinction. The respectable and and the shady come in. Uh, The the good and the evil, I think this is from human perspective here, speaks of... I'm willing to show grace to all. So don't qualify yourself saying, oh, I don't deserve to be in the presence of the king. I don't deserve to get this invitation. Look at me. No, the invitation goes to all. And friend, if you're a Christian today, the reason is because God greatly loves his son and Jesus is worthy of honor and worthy of praise. That's why you're a believer, because you were saved to ascribe him that. To worship him. Because Israel here rejects the offer. After Christ's resurrection, he gives his disciples the great commission. And he says, go into all the world, Matthew 28, 19. Invite all. And that's exactly what they did. If you look at Acts, Acts 13, for instance, Paul says, Paul and Barnabas, they say, For so the Lord commanded us, saying, I have placed you as light to the Gentiles, that you may bring salvation to the ends of the earth. To all the guys who are in the alleyways and the highways and the byways. And when the Gentiles heard this, they began rejoicing and glorifying the word of the Lord. And as many as had been appointed to eternal life, believed. This is what the wedding feast is all about. It's salvation. As many as heard this, they begin to rejoice because, wow, they're not excluded. Everybody's in. Come. Everybody's invited. The Gentiles, they come to the feast. But... Is this plan B? Because Israel rejected. Are Gentiles plan B? No. This was always God's plan. Look with me at Isaiah 49.6. Isaiah 49.6. I could read it to you, but um, if you want to open there with me. It's a great and glorious verse, and I think you need to mark it down, underline it, because it reveals God's plan. And God says this. Is it too small a thing? It it is too small a thing. It's a statement, not a question. 
It is too small a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to restore the preserved ones of Israel. I will also make you a light to the nations so that my salvation will reach, reach the ends of the earth. In other words, what God is saying is, Israel, I know I, I love you and I gave you everything, but I am, I am glorious. I am worthy, God says. And I am more worthy than just for one nation to praise me, to worship me. I need everybody to worship me. He is the creator of the world. And therefore, he says, I will make you a light to the nations. Friends, God is worthy to be praised by all the people, all nations, and such is the gospel invitation. And I pray that if you haven't responded, that you will feel just the, the weight of this opportunity that has been afforded to you. This glorious God, he invites you to come, to have life, to feast. But there's a stipulation. There's a proper way for you to respond to God's gracious call. There's a requirement. There's a proper way to embrace God's gracious invitation and that's where we get to if we go back to Matthew 22 in the final verses 11 through 14 there's a proper way to respond once everyone is gathered the slaves do their work they proclaim this invitation and a bunch of people come to the point that the wedding hall is filled with dinner guests it's full not a single seat empty and then the king comes in and the king looks at the guests, he scans the crowd. And one sticks out like a sore thumb. One. He looks and he is distracted by one who we are told is not wearing the wedding clothes. And he said to him, friend, how did you come in here without wearing the wedding clothes? Now, there's a lot of discussion as to what this clothing, what this garment is, what it could possibly mean here or just in, in the rest of the Bible. Many cite the fact that when during, at, at these times, in the ancient times, when, when a feast of this magnitude would be offered, then the host, whether that's a king or any host, he would not only invite you in, but he would prepare clothing for you to, to put on before you would enter his feast. One commentator says this as an application. He says the reason why they did this, quote, in this way the poor need not be ashamed of their rags and the rich no right to be proud of their dinner jackets or gowns. All come in on the same footing, just as in the parable of the workers in the vineyard. There is room for neither embarrassment nor for pride in the feast of the kingdom all come in on the same footing what are these clothes well you know if you look at the bible the bible contains uh, various themes that you can trace from genesis to revelation like grace god's grace you can trace it from genesis 1 1 all the way to revelation or the theme of kingdom or or, or the the theme of um covenant temple for instance right well, one of these main themes is also clothing. Believe it or not, Bible has a lot to say and to speak about clothing. So in the very beginning, when you look at the Genesis account, Genesis chapter 3, you might recall after the fall, Adam and Eve, they, they do what? They sew up uh, clothing for themselves of fig leaves. They, they try to put it on and they try to impress the Lord. Why? Because they're, they're ashamed and, and God is not pleased. God ends up actually sacrificing an animal and providing proper clothing for them at that particular time, one that's made out of lamb skin. That's the one that was pleasing to the Lord. Innocent animal dies and God provides them clothing. Later on, we read that during the setup of tabernacle and, and the temple, uh, priests were told, when you come and approach God, you approach God with proper clothing. You wash up. You have to look the part. Here's exactly what you wear. Here are the type of stones that you will have on your clothing. Why? Because I'm a holy God, you approach me in proper clothing. 
And when you go to the prophets later on in, in Isaiah 64, there's a reference to our clothing, human clothing, and, and it goes something like this, Isaiah 64, 6, all of our righteous deeds are like filthy garments. And here's the case where, where our English word filthy doesn't do its justice. This translation filthy, it, it literally refers to uh, filth, um, secretion, bodily secretion, from a women's menstrual period. That's what it refers to here. And God says, all of your religion, all of your righteous deeds, all the things that you think are good and beautiful and pretty, it looks to me like that. It's as if you're coming to God dressed in that. And you think you're all impressive. And God says, no, you're not. And that is why three chapters before in Isaiah 61, the nation of Israel cries out prophetically. He, they say, he has clothed me with garments of salvation. He has wrapped me with a robe of righteousness. Again, clothing. Then you get to the New Testament, of course, and you can go all the way to the end. We can't look at every single passage that refers to clothing, but you go and you look at, for instance, Revelation 7-9. If you go to Revelation 7-9... John writes this, after these things I looked and behold a great multitude which no one could count from every nation and all tribes and peoples and tongues standing before the throne and before the Lamb clothed in white robes and palm branches were in their hands. Why are they white robes? Well, 714 says that they have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb. The blood was provided by God. And when you go to 19, 7 and 8, to the very end almost, Revelation 19, we read this, Let us rejoice and be glad and give glory to him, for the marriage of the Lamb has come and his bride has made herself ready. Here's the feast. Here, here's the final feast. It's the final salvation. And it was given to her to clothe herself in fine linen. It was given to her. Clothing is provided by God. And friends, if you go back to Matthew and you consider the, this is overall context of the Bible, but I want us to land here. I want us to land in Matthew. What was Matthew's point so far? What has he labored to communicate to all of his readers? What was Christ's point that he was trying to deliver through his earthly ministry. He was basically saying, you need me. You need me to give you something that you do not have. And even if you think your clothing is beautiful, here is my assessment. Go back to Isaiah 64. That your righteousness is not good. You need me to give you something. You need me to wrap you in something that makes you presentable. That makes you presentable i need to clothe you so how do you prepare for the king to be met with him well what is the requirement the requirement is that you need to make yourself ready by turning from sin and trusting in the righteousness of jesus christ alone you become clothed in the righteousness of Christ. That is why Paul always used this metaphor, put on. And so in Romans 13, says, he sa Paul says, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Friends, the only garment that the Father will accept on any of his guests at his son's wedding is the righteousness of his own son. The righteousness of his own. Anything else and anyone else will be thrown out into the outer darkness and that is as we looked at already to a few of these references when we study the parables in Matthew that is a reference to hell that's a description of hell what Jesus is saying that this man who went into the wedding feast and who thought he would be accepted he hated me he hated the son he hated the father and so this recliner commits in fact exactly the same crime as the decliners earlier on in the parable he dishonored the king he did not consider the son worthy he did not consider his work worthy and so in the end 
everyone who is not clothed with Christ by faith alone. And then we have Christ's commentary in verse 14. For many are called. For many are called, but few are chosen. Here's the question. Who in the right mind would reject this great offer, would reject this great inf uh, invitation? Who? And the answer is everybody. Everybody. All reject it. Because sin has so blinded the eyes and has so darkened the mind of the unbelieving that this invitation does not register with them. They don't see it. All disrespect the king with his son. And the point is, if it wasn't for God's enabling grace in choosing sinners to see and to understand, all would be damned. And that is why in Matthew 11, Jesus prays and he says, I praise you, Father of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and intelligent and have revealed them to the infants. Yes, Father, for this way was pleasing in your sight. All things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows the Son except the Father, nor does anyone know the Father except the Son, and anyone to whom the Son wills to reveal him. Come to me. Come to me. The invitation goes out to all. You come. But it requires the divine, sovereign grace, saving grace to open the eyes for you to see. And if you see it here, why wouldn't you come? And so this is my last appeal. Have you responded or are you indifferent Maybe you're just living life. Maybe you're thinking about today and everything that you have going on. You're just not interested. You're so busy with life. Friends, life will go on, but the king is worthy for you to pause and consider. His grace reigns today. Today is the time of grace, time of salvation. His wrath is yet to come. So come. Come. Jesus says, what would a prophet a man, if he gains the whole world, if he has multiple businesses, if he has a lot of possessions, what would a gain, what would a profit a man if he gains the whole world yet forfeits his soul? We're dealing with soul here. We're dealing with soul. Oh, consider the goodness of God. He invites you not to a funeral, but to a wedding to rejoice and to enjoy life. You really do need to move some things around on your calendar. It's that important. It's that important. He deserves it. And you need it. But then the rest of us, for those of us who have responded to this call, how do we demonstrate that we no longer live for ourselves, but as Paul says in 2 Corinthians, but for, the him, who but for him who loved us and gave himself up for us? Is he worthy? And so when we consider our lives, what does it mean to live by faith in everyday things, in our businesses, in our jobs, in our, our families and everything else? Do we demonstrate that this king is worthy of our submission daily? Oh, he's worthy. And that's why Paul says, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provisions for the flesh. I just want you to rejoice this morning. I just want you to see that we have been given a great privilege and we're in and that's why we're here this morning worshiping the Lord. But for those of you who are here week after week after week and have not done this, uh, the king is pleading, come. Come and behold my son. I got everything. Don't try to work it up. Don't do anything else. Don't contribute. Come and believe. Come and trust. Isn't that a glorious message that we can then take to the world? If we affirm it, we take it and we preach it boldly because he has enough to cover our sin. He has enough garments to cover the sins of the world and the sinners. That's a glorious message and I want you to rejoice in that and praise the Lord and let us do that even this moment. Father, we thank you. We praise you. This is a great 
um, invitation, and we thank you that we have responded to it, that you allow us to see this truth. I praise you, Father, and I pray, I pray that there would be some here. I know that there are some here who, who have been here week after week, and, and they haven't accepted the call, and so I pray, would you just build up this urgency in them? And for us, Lord, to continually worship you, to make much of you, you are worthy. Uh, you are worthy of our neighbor's praises. And so I pray that we would go out there and proclaim your truth to these neighbors who are around us. From our children who are yet saved, we ask that you would work in their hearts, that their tongues would cry out to you as well. Oh, we look forward to this day. We thank you. We praise you. And we rejoice in this great invitation and great news. We praise you and ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen.